All right, so when we named this church a few weeks back, we named it Rise Up. And um, there were a lot of reasons, and we scoured the scriptures and looked for um, verses that we thought represented the, the reasoning behind the name and uh, what God wanted from us and kind of just what he was speaking to us. I have the verse right here. I'm going to read it to you. It has everything to do with our sermon today. It says, Rise up and shine. For your light has come. This is kind of like our signature verse. Probably be with it. Rise up church forever. Rise up and shine for your light has come. The shining greatness of the Lord has risen upon you. For see, darkness will cover the earth. Anybody seen that lately? Much darkness will cover the people. It was written back in Isaiah a long time ago. But the Lord will rise upon you and his shining greatness will be seen upon you. Amen. Nations will come to your light and kings will see the shining greatness of the Lord on you. Hallelujah. Is that not a great verse for us or yes. what? Yeah. Is that not timely? So the title of the message today is Rise Up and Shine. The topic of our discussion today really is influence. So if you got a handout, well if you didn't get one, please raise your hand and we'll get you one. I know you're not in it for a handout. I've got to think of a new, a new name for that. But if you need notes, hold it. Up your hand, they'll get you one. The very first line is blank. Write the word influence, all caps. That's what this is about. As a verb, influence typically means to affect or change someone or something in an indirect but usually important way. To influence somebody. It represents, I think it represents the difference you can make with your life. And you can write that in there too. The next line. The difference you can make with your life. You see that? Everybody got it? You with me on the notes? Okay, so the first one is influence. The second one is the difference you can make with your life. See if you can finish these phrases out loud with me. One bad apple. One bad apple. Well, it was a whole bunch. A little leaven. Anybody? Leavens the whole lump. Right, kind of similar to the apple thing. In order to have friends, one must be friendly. friendly. Bad company corrupts good character. You become like the people you hang out, hang out, out with, with or hang around. How about this one? If you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. fleas. <laughs> We're talking about influence today. The difference you can make with your life. As stewards of everything that God gave us, one of the primary things we have the responsibility to use or to manage for God's glory is the influence that God has given each one of us. Next one in your notes is everyone has influence. And for those who would like to resist this message thinking, you know what, I'm not really interested in influencing others, let me assure you, you already do. Mm -hmm. We all have some kind of influence in this world, and we're supposed to. We can't take the, I can, I can talk about Charles Barkley, you guys might remember, he's a famous basketball player. And some years back, he famously tried to avoid his place of influence when he said, I don't want to be anybody's role model. Of course, he was trying to tell us that professional athletes shouldn't be role models. It's not fair. Parents and teachers and locals and friends, they should be the role models in the lives of our young people. Well, the fact is, professional athletes are role models, whether they want to be or not. And the further truth is, we're all role models to someone, somehow, some way. So we have to make a decision as we go through our life influencing people. And we have to understand how to influence people in the right direction and not in the wrong one. Have you ever noticed that it's really easy to be good when you're with some people? Yes. And maybe it's really easy to be kind of bad when you're with some other people? Yes. Can we be honest? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. You know there's some people you wouldn't think twice about sharing a little off-color joke with. And then there's other people you wouldn't even think about it once. Not going to happen. So at first blush, you might still be in that place and said, look, my goal in life isn't so egocentric that I want to be influential. I just want to be faithful. And that's nice. That's a wonderful sentiment. No doubt very biblical. But are you sure? What if being faithful, what if being faithful is being influential? You mean to tell me if you're a parent, you don't want to influence your children towards certain behaviors and certain attitudes, certain values? And is it somehow wrong or unchristian to be a person of influence? Our Lord Jesus 
is without question the most influential human being who ever lived. Even those who don't believe in him or follow him have been influenced by his life. And Paul is certainly the second most influential person in the New Testament history of the church. So in light of those facts, can we really say that we should shun influence? I say no. And I think scripture bears it out. Now, of course, if you're a parent, you want to be a person of influence as someone who can affect the lives of your children, the values of your children, when you're not with them. And my kids are getting to that age where I'm not going to be with them all the time. My youngest is up here 15 years old. Our oldest is 21. we got a boy in between. It's very clear to me that they are going to be living and making... Sorry, I dropped my makeup. <laughs> <laughs> this will come in handy later. So, all right, so... So it's, <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. I know. Um, so I'm not talking about control or dominance. I just want to put that out there. Control or dominance is what you exercise when you're in the presence of your children and they do what you want them to do because there are fear repercussions. Because, you know, you're there. So that's why they do it. Influence, on the other hand, is what leads them to do the right thing that you've taught them to do when you're there or when you're not. It's different. When our children aren't with us, we can't control them. We can only influence them because we've raised them to be their own people. And isn't it the same in a way if you're a friend or if you're a mentor or if you're a leader or if you're a spouse? The influence is something you hope they carry with them when you're not there. A mother took her young son shopping and after a day in the stores, the clerk handed the little boy a candy bar. What do you say, the mother said to the boy, as mothers often do. The boy said, just put it on my credit card. <laughs> like it or not, the mom had influenced that little boy by her actions through the day. I remember making a comment years ago, and it was just a casual, offhanded comment um, about needing to come up with some money. You know, and you need to come up with some money. And, and uh, Bella was with us. Bella, I think she was like six or seven at the time. She goes, Daddy, why don't you just go to an ATM machine? And she goes, those things are always handing out money. <laughs> Dead serious. <laughs> yeah. Another mom was taking her little boy to school, and since the dad had to go to work early that day, the mom took him. That was a change, because dad usually took the boy. And the little boy kept looking around on the way to school, and halfway there, the little boy said, Mom, where are all the idiots? <laughs> She goes, what do you mean? She goes, well, usually by this part of the drive, Dad and I have seen at least three or four idiots. <laughs> Talking about influence. <laughs> in the letter to Galatians, Paul, in the Message Bible, wrote, I began my ministry in the regions of Syria and Sicilia. After all that time and activity, I was still unknown by face among the Christian churches in Judea. There was only this report. That man who once persecuted us is now preaching the very message he used to try to destroy us. Their response was to recognize and worship God because of me. So would you like people to say that about you? I'm not, I'm not asking you to be egotistical and puffed up. Paul didn't say they praised me for what I did. He said they praised God because of me. Because of such a radical change in my life, I was like this, killing them all. Now I'm ministering to them all. They said that can only be God, and they praised God for the change that took place in his life. It's better, I mean, we wouldn't want to say, we wouldn't want people to say they cursed God because of me, certainly, or they ignored God because of me, because of the influence I had on them. So I think Paul's statement is good for each of us. They praise God because of me. Next one for your notes is you were created to influence the world. You were created to influence the world. So much stuff up here. Okay, Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, I think, I think where that comes from is sometimes they used to gather salt from the seashore. And there would be other minerals and things mixed in it because salt is salt, right? But what it's saying here is if it loses its saltiness, meaning if the salt got out of the mixture and it no longer tasted salty, what good is it except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot? It's like dirt. In the next verse, he says, you're the light of the world. 
the light of the world. Think about that. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good de deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Two things, salt and light. Salt and light. We're supposed to be salt and light as Christians. You are the salt of the earth. And one of the remarkable things about salt is that it preserves things. If you salt meat or fish, it will last a long time. It's how they used to do it when they didn't have refrigeration. They put it in salt, like bacala, right? When I go down to the Italian market in San Diego, they have bacala, big old pieces of fish, like salty cardboard. You can take it with you and then put it in this wonderful brew. We got some Italian cooks in here. I'm kind of like, this is a hint. Bacala. <laughs> um, but salt is an amazing thing. Not only does it preserve, it disinfects. Not only does it disinfect, it tastes good. I mean, sometimes you can have a dish that somebody made and spent a lot of time on with all the right ingredients, but the first thing they'll say, how is it? Does it need salt? salt. The first thing that can make flavors come to life, salt. So we're supposed to have some of that. Salt was so valuable back then that they would pay the Roman soldiers and different people with bags of salt. And they would say, hey, that man's worth his salt, salt right? That's where it came from. Kind of interesting. Is he worth his salt or not? Is he worth it? Is he pulling his weight? And actually, not to make this a sermon about salt, but the they called it solarium. So here's your solarium. It's where we get the word salary from today. It was valuable. So God's saying you're valuable for a reason not to be hidden. You're supposed to preserve and prevent decay and, and make things better. So are you an influence that prevents decay and rot in others, or do you go right along with the trend? And I know all of you, you're not going along with it, but we need to be reminded. The Bible says we're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Two things. It's a metaphorical way of speaking about influence. We're called to be lights so that others will move away from darkness toward the light of Christ. We're not shining our light so people will follow us. We're letting the light of God shine through us so others might find their way, like a lighthouse. So that others might know what a great and glorious God we serve. That's the bottom line. Amen. So the next one for your notes in trying to have godly influences is, is seek God's approval above all else. And this, this needs to be said. It's almost ironic because we think if we want to influence people, they have to approve of us. They have to like us. And listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 1.10. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Notice there are two different options. Of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So right away we see the beginning point in becoming a person of influence is grounded in our seeking God's approval rather than man's approval. This is, like I said, it's ironic. Our base instincts tell us that we have to please people if we want to influence them. They, they have to like us and agree with us and think like us. Politicians do it. Preachers do it. People in all walks of life make this mistake. Um, you got that for your notes, right? Above all else? Yes. Did you get that? All right. Understand the difference between influence and popularity. This is worth mentioning, too. Popularity is a social phenomenon that dictates who or what is like best. Sometimes it's called in vogue. You know, it's the thing. It's the it girl or the it guy. It's like the thing. It's popular now. But influence is the power to cause behavior or a change or affect people without forcing it to happen. God gives us this kind of influence, causing us to change, or, or allowing us to be agents of change without forcing change. It's because God gives us free will, right? We get to choose. And then allowing us the desire to want to change, and then make the choices that lead to that change. Popularity just comes from the culture, and it's assigned to the individual, or to a movie, or a fashion, or anything that's, that's well-liked. Now here, if you're, if you're popular, and you upset people, you probably won't be popular too much longer. But if you're in leadership, you might regularly be called upon to influence people who aren't very happy with you. Parents? Halfway Christians don't influence anyone like they could. They end up being influenced by everyone else. It's like the salt that lost its flavor. It's not worth anything, Jesus said. You might as well throw it out. So, what do we do to have godly influence? I have four beliefs for you to check out. Four key beliefs for godly influence. The first belief is you got to believe that you can make a difference. 
You have to believe that you can make a difference. And I've heard so many people, so many times, think, what difference will it make? What difference can I make? We feel alone, we get self-absorbed, we're always looking inside, thinking that we don't have a purpose, we don't have an assignment, we don't have a destiny. That Nothing could be further from the truth. You have to believe that you can make a difference. He said you're the salt of the earth. We know, we talked about what a difference that makes. And, and light of the world, and a city on a hill, and a lampstand, and let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Rise up and shine, for your light has come. That's the verse. The shining greatness of the Lord has risen upon you. A professor was closing his class for the day. Are there any further questions out there? And one student spoke up and said, how did you change your life? The professor sat and thought for a minute. Are you serious? When the student nodded, the professor took out a small piece of glass. See, I was going to show you this. Now I don't have any sunlight to make it work. But he took out a small piece of glass. And he said, some here. And he said, uh, I found this, and I shaped it, and I scraped its edges into a smooth circle. And he shined it, and he let the light from the mirror play across the ceiling and on the faces of the students. Then he spoke. He said, I found this when I was a kid, and I shaped it and scraped it against a rock. I was fascinated with it because I could hold it and reflect light into the darkest corner of a room with it. It amazed me. I decided to spend my life just reflecting the light into as many dark places as I could. Every single person on this earth, including you, has the potential to make a difference. But you can only do it if you believe what God says about you. And you're willing to give yourself away to others. It's the only way. You see this? I, I don't know if some of you don't know. The business that we've been in for a long time, um, we, listen, and I have a, a patent on a picture frame. And the picture frame allows graphics to be put up on walls or trucks, really big graphics, and to be changed out. And it's really cool. We sell it to sign companies around the country. And I put this up a long time ago. God gave us a vision for a ministry called Frontlines. And the ministry, the way I, we kind of thought about it, we were going through some hard stuff and we felt like we weren't really able to do much for God. And what can we do? And God said, well, what, what's in your hand? And we said, well, we have, this, we have this thing. We can put messages out there in the world. And so we, we created this as an example. This is Photoshop, but wouldn't that be cool? Dark alley in a city overrun by all the junk that's going on. And you turn around the corner and it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. See, isn't that awesome? I mean, we felt like, and this is still alive, it's just sort of been dormant for right now, but we felt like, you know what, the church does a pretty good job of speaking the word and edifying the saints and getting people equipped but outside the walls of the church, nobody is talking about God like he's a real person. Nobody's talking about him like he's in the room. It's a, it's a concept. It's a, oh, you know, there's evangelicals and there's this and that. So we had a vision to get the word outside the walls of the church, put it on walls in exciting ways that are edgy and provocative. So somebody's walking down the street and they see the sign that says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Amen. Oh my gosh, maybe that's something. You know, people think about it. We saw the movie, one of these movies. What was the movie? Um, God, God's, not dead God's Not Dead 2, the second one. And the girl was, the girl was, uh, she had an attorney, and she was getting persecuted because she spoke about Jesus in class, and she compared the teachings of Christ to the teachings of Martin Luther King, and she got in trouble because she talked about Jesus, and they were taking her to court and making her lose her job and all this stuff. And her attorney was this, you know, young, good-looking dude who wasn't a believer at all, and he's sitting there, and he, he asks her finally, he's like, how did you come to this faith? And she goes, well, I was walking down the street when I was younger, and I was going through a lot of stuff. And she said, I turned the corner, and I saw a sign on this church. And the sign said, who do you say that I am? She goes, I kept walking, but I couldn't shake the question. I just couldn't shake it. Like, I thought about it, and I had to go look things up. And, and anyway, that's led me to where I am today. And her unshakable faith ministering to the Lord influence is what I'm talking about. But anyway, back to this idea. We thought we're going to have a charity. And the way the charity will work is people can donate space. I mean, they can donate money if they want to help advance the cause. Have you seen those signs out there that say prayer changes things? Mm -hmm. Well, I met those people at the dojo where your kids, um, you know, where they train martial arts. And then I lost their card. i got to find it. But they have these signs everywhere. They just go put them up. And it's 2 Corinthians, I think, 7, 14, or 1 Corinthians. Anyway, prayer changes things. And every time I see it, I just pray. And I go, yes, yes, yes. 
people will see prayer changes things. Maybe they'll look at that verse underneath there. And it's like guerrilla warfare, you know? They're putting the signs out there. And so I just love it. But I thought as churches have what they call missional giving, they, they give to missions as, you know, a lot of churches do. It's like they'll focus on a different ministry each month. And then the church will tithe. And they will give to an organization to make sure God's, getting, God's work is getting done in other places like World Vision. Like um, we had a couple here last week who literally, they helped us get the loan to buy this place a year and a half ago. And uh, six months later, they uprooted husband, wife, and their little boy moved to Zambia to run orphanages. In Zambia, like, and they, it's called Breath of Heaven. So that would probably be one of our one of our ministries that we support as a church. But I was thinking, how do you guys like this? Would you guys be able to get behind that if we were if we were starting to find people that had space in public places and we could put messages out there in the world that might draw people? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. We'll come back to it sometime, and I gotta get back to our to our sermon here. But I wanted to share that with you. So seriously, would that be exciting to you guys if we yeah. did that as a church yeah. and just made that part of our mission of giving? Yeah. Me too. Okay, so the next one for your notes is, we, we already said you have to believe that you can make a difference, but you also have to believe that what you share can make a difference. It's not about you, we're sharing something, the Word of God, the love of God, the influence that He gave you. Believe that what you share can make a difference. Proverbs 13, 20 states, let's see it right here, I think it's up. He who walks with wise men will be wise. Pretty simple, right? Like we talked about earlier. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. Simple. He's saying right here, the company that you keep, the influence that people have on you makes a difference. So if Amen. wise people help other people to be wise, obviously what they're sharing has value. And if fools help other people to be destroyed, obviously what they're sharing also has a value, high or low, right? It's got, it's got some kind of influence. So you have to believe as a believer that what you share can make a difference. That's the bottom line. You have to come to a place where you absolutely believe that what you have to offer can make a difference in the lives of others, because then you'll offer it. If you don't believe in it, you're not going to offer it. That's good. Some years back, some people in our church had really been influenced about the plight of the unborn, and they, you know, they influenced some people to get involved and to, um, you know, kind of speak up for people, the little ones in the womb that couldn't speak for themselves. And these people influenced me, and I was actually privileged to be able to go to be a keynote speaker at a, at a breakfast. And um, as I was doing my research, it led me to a woman by the name of Gianna Jessen. And she had a profound influence on me. Listen to this. She was adopted at birth. And later on, her parents let her know that she was a survivor of a failed abortion. <coughs> She was bathed in a saline solution in the womb for about 18 hours. It caused a lack of oxygen. She was delivered alive, but she only weighed two pounds. And I think she's in her 30s now. She said to the interviewer, I was watching this interview, and she said, today I have the gift of cerebral palsy. And the interviewer said, you do have a limp, but you've run marathons. She, says, she smiled and said, by the grace of God, yes. He said, why do you call it a gift? She said, well, I am just unashamedly a Christian. I can't even walk without the assistance of God. I wasn't even supposed to move. So, I mean, I've got a lot of joy. And there are so many that don't, and they want some. And so I just feel like it's part of my mission to sort of spread it around. Mm -hmm. Influence. Believe in people. Believe that what you share can make a difference. The third part is believe the person you influence can make a difference. So, so you got, if you make a difference, you believe what you share makes a difference, and now you've got to believe that the person that you influence can make a difference. It's simply, do you value people enough to invest in them, enough to use your influence so that they can make a difference just the way that you're trying to make a difference? Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. This is about valuing people and believing in people. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 says, The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Everybody matters. Everybody matters. Congregation, you can do what I can't do. I can do some things maybe some of you can't do. He can do what she can't do, and she can do what he can't do. But together, God says we can do great things. Amen. 
there's a story about a famous organist back in the 1800s. Um, he would go from town to town putting on concerts. And in every town, he had to hire a boy to pump the organ because the organ had to have air pressure for the sound to come out. So he would hire these boys and he would play his concert. And one particular performance, he couldn't shake the boy. It was over and uh, the boy followed the musician back to his hotel. And the boy said, we sure had us a great concert tonight, didn't we? And the man said, what do you mean we? I had a great concert. Come on, it's late. Why don't you go home? So the next night, when the organist was halfway through this magnificent, complex crescendo, and the noise was coming out, and it was piping, it was a beautiful thing, the organ quit. It just went out. <laughs> and the organist was stunned and dismayed and alarmed. And just then, the little boy stuck his head out around the curtain and goes, We ain't having a very good concert tonight, are we? <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> Believe in people. Gotta believe in people. Everybody matters, and in God's hand, everybody's powerful. And the fourth one, the fourth key belief to have godly influence is you gotta believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You gotta believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have that picture? I always love this picture. I've had it for years. The task ahead of you is never as great as the power behind you. It says, "Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might." Notice that's a soldier, right? Yeah. I'm going to understand God is love, but we're in a fight. Amen. And we need to understand and believe that the task of ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us or the power within us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read Jesus talking. He says, you shall receive power. Let me say power. power. And he says, you shall. Okay, it's, you are going to receive power. Now, when does he say we're going to receive it? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It means you don't have power yet. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to receive power. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the world, the end of the world, or earth, excuse me. We're talking about power. Divine power. Do you have that next graphic? Holy, I think we do. Okay? Holy Trinity. God. The Father. The Son. The Holy Spirit. Notice he's called helper and power. The mission of all of it is influence. The mission of all of it is the gospel. Anything, I'm telling you, anything of eternal value while we're on this earth comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Once we become disciples and have received the Spirit of God, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. the helper, a.k.a. the empowerer, then God begins to work in us. He transforms us into the image of Christ. As disciples, we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. And then we're led into life and peace. Jesus knew, he knew that his disciples would need power to carry out their mission. To be a witness to the world, to have any kind of lasting influence. So the night before he was crucified, he told his disciples in John 14, 16. Now listen now, here's the whole trinity in one verse. Check this out. Jesus, the Son, says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. From the Amplified Bible, the helper is also comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, all yes. those things to be with you for how long? Forever. How long? Forever. Forever. So that, and then here's another second half of the verse from the message. So that you will always have someone with you. How long? Forever. Always. When? Always. always. Right. Always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. Listen to this, the godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for, but you know him already because he's been staying with you and will even be in you. How about Hallelujah! That? How about that? Yes. You have access to wisdom and power and revelation to change your life and influence the lives of others, and it comes from the spirit of the living God, the divine helper living on the in inside of you. And I... Some people, I'm amazed, they go to church for decades and they're told to be good. But for some reason they lived their whole life and never knew about the treasure that's living on the inside of them, living within them. They were never told about it. And whoever you are or wherever you are or wherever you go to church, if you never hear about the Holy Spirit, you need to change churches. I'm not, I'm not saying you need to change it, maybe, but I'm saying, I'm saying, no, I'm saying because somebody isn't telling you the whole truth. Right? Preach it! 
If you're not being told about the Holy Spirit, you're not being told the whole truth. The whole story is God the Father, God the Son, and God our helper, the Holy Spirit. He helps with our weaknesses. Yeah. He convicts believers of sin. He indwells us, and He gives gifts to believers that flow out from the inside of us. These gifts are manifested in the lives of others, and there is no other kind of influence that ever compares to that kind of influence. Listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians 1, or 12, 7 through 11. Now, to each one... Of the manifestation, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for why? Somebody help me. Do you have that? For the common good. Yeah, it's in your notes. Thank you. So, it's given for the common good. I'll just read it. To one, and this is talking about the body of Christ. He's saying to all of you, the manifestation of the Spirit, means He's there, is given for the common good. That means the good of all. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. Okay? Word of wisdom. Somebody's given that. To another... Faith, I'm sorry, to another a message of knowledge, to another a phone call. <laughs> hey, if that ain't Jesus calling, you better not answer. Oh, saw that in a movie. All right, so anyway, let me go back. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, okay? Two gifts, same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing sp between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. And all these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. You get that? God's just busy. He's in us. He's saying, here, you. You get this one. You get this one. You can have these two. And you up here. I'm going to manifest it. I'm going to make some difference in some people's life. But you have to open up and let me flow. Amen. That's what God's telling us. I put you here for a reason. Not to just breathe and take off ox oxygen and make a living and get your retirement and die. He said, do something. That's Let's right. do it. That's because, right. you know, we don't earn our way to heaven. No, God gives that to us through faith by His grace. But once we're saved, we're supposed to do some stuff. Because faith right. without works is dead. So salt the world. Light the world. Give it out. You know what? Just give it out and be the vessels God called us to be. That's why belonging to a church is so important. And I didn't get this for a long time. But it's important that you're plugged into a yeah. group of believers. Mm. Because the enemy of your soul is out to trap you. He's out to knock you down and take you out. Mm. And when you don't believe in the power that's behind you and actually on the inside of you, you're going to have a tendency to operate in fear. And that fear is going to water down everything else you do. It's gonna, your salt's going to lose its saltiness. Your light's going to have a dimmer switch that reduces you to a dull glow. That's why it's important to be part of a thriving, vibrant community, a connected church. And if the devil can't get you to turn your back on God, he's going to try to isolate you. That's always what he likes to do, separate and destroy. Divide and That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to destroy your family and rob you of your influence and your destiny. And one of the greatest things that you can do is protect yourself, or to protect yourself, is to get other people involved in your life. I'm closing with this, but you can get other people involved in your life to fight the good fight with you. You're not alone. Even if it sometimes means lovingly speaking the truth of God that you might not want to hear, but you might desperately need to hear. There's moral protection because you make better decisions. There's physical protection because you're in a safe place. And there is spiritual protection because God is doing warfare and your prayer brothers and sisters are also doing warfare, standing in the gap, in the spirit, Asking for God's protection. And there's a lot going on that we don't see. It's a spiritual battle. Glory to God. As Christians, we're in the greatest danger when we're isolated. And we tend to do that when we're going through the most pain. Which is even worse. Nowhere in the Bible are we ever referred to as little bodies of Christ. There's a little body of Christ. There's a little body of Christ. Why? Because none of us is given everything we need to grow in Christ apart from the rest of the body. We are the body of Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9 through 12 says, Two people, and I know this is familiar to you, but let's think about it. Two people can accomplish more than twice as much as one. More than twice as much as one. They get a better return on their labor. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone, when they fall, are in real trouble. And on a cold night, two under the same blanket can gain warmth from each other. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. 
Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Here's the conclusion. We can accomplish more together than we ever imagined. And influence has many faces. It might come in the form of a smile, a prayer, the truth spoken in love, an encouraging word at the right time, a discipline, a tear shed on one's behalf. It might look like three truckloads of mulch from the neighbor. <laughs> it might look like a nice hot cup of espresso or some plants. You know who I'm talking about. You know who you are. Discipline. <laughs> um, influence might be an act of kindness, a listening ear, a heartfelt note, a hug, an apology. It could be the shortcut that you don't take at work. Or the comment that you don't make when a certain type of person walks by. It may look like forgiveness. The kindness of God that leads to repentance. A line of scripture. Your influence could be extended by the faith someone sees in your life while you're going through some kind of trial. It could be the word of your testimony which won't influence anyone if you don't tell it. Influence is your attitude. It's your devotion. It's your lifestyle. It's your communication. You get it from God and you turn it loose. Amen. In love. So I'm going to say, turn it loose in love. Turn it loose in love. For the common good. Everybody. Today, will you commit to glorify God with your influence? Will you? Yes. Is that everybody? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your influence is so unmistakable.